Welcome in. Blue White Breakdown time brought to you by Penn Live. Penn State Maryland Week. That's Johnny McGonigal. I'm Dustin Hockensmith. Uh, Johnny, we have, you know, a game this week that, by the way, uh, I've just been watching the point spread a bit. And I'm really fascinated to see a lot of people are picking this game really hovering around that point spread. And the point spread went from, I believe, nine and a half to eight and a half which I guess indicates that people were liking Maryland with that number of points uh, in this game. But that's a pretty interesting sentiment out there because as I'm looking around and I'm reading your pick and I'm reading, you know, other people around the beat and things like that, they're not seeing it as, as I like Maryland with the points. It's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, Dustin, it's, you know, I think I had Penn state winning, um, you know, covering, but, but, you know, doing so by a few points, like, I, I also don't think anyone, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you, you, know, you saw a prediction or two that would differentiate from this, but you know, I don't see anyone picking Penn State to win like they did last year, 30 to nothing, or yeah. you know, a few years back, like it, what was it, 66 to nothing or something like that. Like, you know, this is a Maryland team that started off 5-0 and undefeated, has hit a three-game losing skid, you know, against Ohio State, uh, Illinois, and Northwestern. Like, you understand the Ohio State loss, Illinois and Northwestern, not so much, especially giving up six sacks to Northwestern, um, you know, last week, which is something that will be tied into one of our, you know, conversation points on this podcast about Penn State's defense. But yeah, I, I think it's one of those where, you know, they've got enough there and Penn State isn't necessarily playing its best ball uh, right now that you could see a, a tightish game. Um, I'm going to take us a little off track. Or early in this thing. And it seems to take us to some good places, I feel like, sometimes. But it's fascinating to me. So Maryland losing, winning five straight and losing three straight is like the Mike Loxley era playing out in, in, in you know, in the 2023 season. And I, I just feel like, you know, personality stuff and like tendency stuff when it comes to coaches and their programs is an area that fascinates me. Like, I think it's an area of human study that, that is pretty remarkable. Like I look at Mike Loxley, like this guy in life doesn't seem to care about the little things too much. And Maryland never is consistent with the little things. They're all, whether it's flags or untimely, you know, mistakes, like that is just kind of the, how Maryland has gone. Mike Loxley's recruited well. I think he's done some things to coach that team in, into a pretty good place, but every year it's that same thing. Penn State, my amateur psychological evaluation is that, you know, I think James Franklin at his core isn't the most cocksure leader that you are looking for. Like the guy who's, who's confident above all else. He questions everything. He questions himself about everything. And I think sometimes that makes its way into his team as well. One last example that I promise move on. Uh, Lincoln Riley at USC, previously at Oklahoma. He does not care about defense at all. And he can say certain things or hire the right person or recruit the right thing. His program, wherever he's going, is going to try to force itself to care about defense. And that comes back and bites him. So I just think... Um, you know, the, these tendencies with programs are, are interesting, but I don't think you can argue that Maryland has had this type of tendency to flash and fizzle all the time. The question going into this game is, to what extent are they, are, are they in the process of fizzling? Was their fizzle only a three-week fizzle? Uh, and how can you say anything for shizzle, Johnny? <laughs> my, my wife's in the background, and she just said, oh, my God. A lot of fizzle talk. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of fizzle talk. A lot of hashtag fizzle talk. Um, it is, it is, and and this is history in the making because I think that is the single stupidest thing I've, I've ever said on a recorded situation. That that's a that, that's a bar clearing, uh, <laughs> bar clearing uh, occurrence it, there, Dustin. It is, it. it is, and I think it otherwise took away from a pretty a pretty good string of points, if I might. Yeah, if yeah, I might it say was so. very like well crafted, just a cogent. <laughs> kind of point you were making and then you, and then you finish. Like, <laughs> um, and that right there is the story of my life, Johnny, that, that is me. See that finished the, the way you finished that totally threw me off. Cause I was just ready to pounce with a Brian Ferentz joke because ah. you mentioned Lincoln Riley, not caring about defense. And I, you know, he cares about defense as much as Iowa cares about offense. Uh, credit <laughs> to credit to Iowa's interim athletic director for finally putting the joke um, you know, the, the end to, to the joke that is Brian Ferentz this week. Um, 
but that aside, no, it's, it's interesting with, with where Maryland is right now, you know, before the season, I put out like a preseason predictions thing, very oddly specific preseason predictions. And within that, I think it was within that, um, or maybe it was within a mailbag that I was talking about Maryland. Before the season, I predicted that Maryland would win nine games. And starting off 5-0, and oh, I thought they would get there. Like, basically, my thought was they're going to lose Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State, and then beat the rest of the teams on their schedule. Like, they shouldn't, you know, they should not have lost to Illinois, and they certainly shouldn't have lost to Northwestern, but they yeah. did. They're here now. They're 5-3. and three. Um, they still, you know, they have Penn State upcoming this weekend. A Penn State team that, like I mentioned, hasn't been playing its best ball. But, you know, coming off the Ohio State loss, it was sluggish against Indiana. There were some boos on the offense. And and now you go to Maryland and face a team that's lost three in a row, but, you know, obviously wants to get back on track. And it would be a huge, huge feather in Mike Loxley's cap and Talia Tagovailoa's cap you know, in terms of his career if he's able to. Uh, to beat Penn State uh, this weekend. I don't see it happening, but at the same time, it would be a real turning point, I feel like, for Loxley's program if they were able to do that. Uh, whereas Penn State, you know, a, lot of, a lot of fans, I shouldn't say a lot, but I, some of that I've talked to are already you know, still just talking about Michigan. And really, as soon as the Ohio State game was over, was talking about Michigan. But you can't overlook Maryland, uh, despite the last you know, three games that they've had. And I think you you see what when they spike upward, and they're at home too. I mean, that hasn't always meant a lot in this series. Um, one of the dynamics, and this sets up well for a, a story that you posted off of um, James Franklin speaking, is this Penn State defense, um, and its eagerness. I think is is how you put it to prove itself again after that one week. We, I think Penn State fans would hope that one week blip on the radar against Indiana. And I think that might be the one of the single biggest storylines of this game is is how that Penn State defense moves on from what I think think can best be called uncharacteristic uh, communication slash effort that led to a 90 yard touchdown and a 69 yard touchdown to an Indiana offense that hadn't created anything explosive against anybody all year. So that was a, a really surprising thing. And and the thought is basically in my eyes like. You know, you you do that against Maryland. That's a, that's a, that's a team and a quarterback that can make you pay if you do have any self inflicted stuff on defense. So I think what you saw against Indiana, it, it needs to be a one off. This, this team probably needs to lead Penn State to victory again, or at the very least, you know, squash a, a really viable threat in Maryland. Absolutely, no. This is a Penn State defense that, like you mentioned, Dustin, with the ninety yard touchdown, sixty nine yard touchdown, so two touchdown passes allowed of sixty plus yards. Uh, they, they being Penn State, had not allowed you – know, they, they had allowed two of those in the previous five seasons combined. So you talk about it being uncharacteristic. It is very much uncharacteristic. Quantifiably so, Johnny. Yes, of this Penn State defense over the last half decade. It just th- That just hasn't happened. Uh, and so the one play, the 90-yarder, I mean, Zaki Wheatley just got beat. You know, he got, he got fooled on his eyes, and guy got right behind him and scored. Uh, the 69 yarder was a complete coverage bust. And James Franklin has, has talked about that a couple of times now this week about, you know, there was just a miscommunication, uh, but talking to players, you know, Devon Ellis was talking a lot about, you know, co- cohesion and communication and about how that is a differentiator between, you know, one of the great defenses, you know, in, in the country and just another defense. And this Penn state defense with the amount of talent that it has and, really what it showed through the first even seven weeks, even at, at Ohio State, you know, holding the Buckeyes to 20 points, I thought proved that it was not only one of the best defenses in the country, but arguably the best. I mean, and they still come out of this Indiana game ranked second in total defense and yards allowed per game behind Michigan. So it's not like, you know, the Indiana game totally just you know, took them out. But at the same time, it was a concerning blip. And it wasn't just those two big plays either. You know, it, it, the third quarter going into the fourth quarter, they allow a 12-play, 75-yard touchdown drive in, in which there was tackling high, missed tackles, you know, just kind of sloppy play, especially from the run defense that had held up so well so far this season. And so when you talk to James Franklin, you know, he pointed it out in his Tuesday presser about how, Devon Ellis addressed the team in the locker room after the Indiana game. And he was lauding, you know, Devon and, and the players and, and how, you know, change and honest conversations sometimes have to be player led. And I think 
Penn State got that from their defense on Sunday when they were going through their film sessions and throughout this week. Uh, those players taking accountability, recognizing what they did against Indiana was not acceptable, uh, and that going into this Maryland game, they can't have those kind of mistakes. Um, they've got too much talent on this defense, Dustin, and, and too good of a defensive coordinator in my mind and Manny Diaz to be making those, to have those kind of lapses against a team like Indiana. And so if, if, it, if, you, if you do that against Talia Tagovailoa and Ja'Shawn Jones and Caden Prather, like those guys will make you pay. Um, and, and I think you want to see Penn State be cohesive and on the same page early in this game too, because uh, P- Penn State's offense right now is not working from a place that it can really dig itself out of a, out of a hole. And so if Penn State's defense is, allows Penn State to get an early lead and they're able to kind of ride that out. That's the kind of game script I think would be ideal for the Nittany Lions this weekend. And just a note with that, <clears throat> I think, you know, you talk about er- making those plays early and being laser focused early. The last time Maryland beat Penn State, it was a lack of laser focus on defense early that that cost them. And you allow, you allow Talia T- uh, Tungabailoa to feel good about himself early and to get those big plays early, it's hard to reverse that as, as the game goes on. So I think this is really important. You know, it's, it's, I have, you know, all the faith in the world that that group and, and Manny Diaz, that they can get back on track, but it was, a, I think a shattering thing for a lot of people because that defense was the only thing people knew they could count on going into a game. Right. And to have that little bit of a breakdown, I think energy and effort are, were understandably a little bit, um, less present uh, coming off of uh, that loss. And then I think probably there was a little bit of guilt there of not taking Brendan Soresby seriously enough as, as a threat. Cause he made, he made a few good plays in that game and two of them went for 159 yards. Yeah. And looking ahead to this weekend, I mean, Penn state's defense, they're going to have their opportunities to make big plays. Talia, you know, attempts 37, passes a game that's second most in the power five uh, behind Shadur Sanders at Colorado. So if he's going to be dropping back that many times against a secondary, that includes Kalen King, Johnny Dixon, uh, some safeties who, yeah, they got burned a couple times or, you know, didn't have their, their best games necessarily uh, last week against Indiana are still uber talented. You like what you have in Daquan Hardy in the slot. If he's dropping back that many times, that's opportunities for the secondary to make big plays. A secondary that, by the way, and a defense, by the way, that this year has still only allowed five passing touchdowns total and has more interceptions, eight, than passing touchdowns allowed, five. So it's a secondary with a lot of talent and a lot of of room and opportunity for those big plays. And, And then a pass rush, too, that sacked Talia last year seven times. And 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 it's better now. And and yeah, and they're going up against the Maryland offensive line that I thought had been better in pass protection up until last week when they let up six sacks to Northwestern. And Northwestern does not have Denai Dennis Sutton off the edge or Adisa Isaac or Zane Durant inside, Abdul Carter, Curtis Jacobs, you know, blitzing from the linebacker position, even Johnny Dixon coming off the edge. They Penn State doesn't even, I mean, obviously they would love to have Chopper Robinson out there, you know, but after the injury that he sustained at Ohio State, I didn't see him on the sideline at all, uh, even like supporting the team. You know, I, I didn't see him there at Beaver Stadium last weekend. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a great sign for his availability this weekend. Um, but I still think this is a defense that can tee off on Maryland's uh, you know, pass, pass protection, especially, especially if Penn State's able to get a lead early and then force Maryland to come from behind. And then real quick, just on the other side, you know, I came out of Indiana, like I know the performance wasn't all that crisp, especially for the first 30 minutes or so, but I came out of that game feeling a little bit more optimistic than it seems like a lot of people are about the state of the offense, because, you know, what I saw was Drew Aller, not just giving a token look downfield, like there was a shift in his thinking, whether that was from coaching or from film study or whatever, where he was really looking for that play down the field. Not just starting his progression there because that's what you do, but but really keeping his eyes there and keep his keeping his intentions there. And I think that transformation can be meaningful um, in, in some of these games coming up. You know, whether he has time to do that against Michigan, I have some big doubts about that, some big questions about that. But I thought what you were looking for, not just the number of attempts down the field, but it, it looked like 
a coaching situation where they got the Drew and, and, and they got together and said, hey, we got we got to flip this around a little bit. We got to stop worrying about the risk and, and start thinking about the rewards a little bit more. Yeah, and I, I saw some discourse around the interception and some thoughts that maybe like this will – this is all, it's almost like a relief or you know, yeah. shoulders that he hasn't thrown. I don't necessarily subscribe to that theory. I don't think throwing interceptions at any point is a good thing. You know, I, I you know, Penn state would have much rather had him not thrown an interception in the situation that he threw. What, if, what if, what if they, you know, when he's up, when they're up 49, nothing on UMass, why don't you just toss it to D end or something? Be like, Hey, here, here, bro. And get it out of the way that way. Yeah. So, so yeah, it, it's, it's one of those where, <laughs> Can't can't agree with that. But what what I do take away is is you know how he responded and how he came out the next yeah. drive and hit Keandre for that fifty seven yard touchdown. Uh, it was a beautiful ball, great tightrope job by Keandre to to keep his feet in and score. And it could unlock something within this offense that now that they've hit one and not only hit one but hit one to win a game, uh, hit one when they really needed it. Uh, yeah, that that can be a real building block for for this offense and specifically for the downfield passing game the problem coming out of the indiana game is that harrison wallace was on the sideline with his right arm in a sling and so a wide receiver room that was already a concern and a question mark just lost its number two receiver And, and say what you will about his production and you know he's he has been you know injury riddled this season so far and has missed some serious time um but James Franklin and the coaching staff and the team and his, you know, the team and everyone really going back to August and even spring camp, it was like well established that Keandre and Trey Wallace, they, they are the top two receivers. The guys. That's everyone else. Uh, and so to not have him, if he's out, uh, it, you know, whether it's this weekend or an extended period of time, that is not a good thing for this offense whatsoever. Um, and, and I think they'll need more production from their tight ends, Theo Johnson, Tyler Warren. They'll need more from the running game. Uh, which was my major concern coming out of the Indiana game was that this is yeah. the worst rush defense in the Big Ten, and you weren't really able to dominate. Like, you know, Katron and Nick combined for, I believe it was 131 yards total against a defense that had been allowing 175 yard rush, rushing yards per game. Uh, so it was a fine game, but it wasn't the kind of game that you ha- have become accustomed to seeing from Katron and Nick really last year when they burst onto the scene as freshmen. Uh, being more downfield centric, I feel like helps all that though. I mean, it's, it's all one interconnected unit. So, you know, one affecting one thing in a positive way can affect everything in in a positive way. I just, I just haven't known, like it, it is, it's baffling that you can have two players of such talent and a commitment to it and coaches that, that are, that love their two running backs and, and they did so much last year and not really have. Um, a lot of explosive success in any one individual game. It's not like you can even look back and be like, hey, you gotta, they got to get back to this game. It just hasn't really been there. And they've made lo- defenses that have been bad, uh, that have struggled in certain areas, look much better in those areas. And that's true. Illinois was bad going into the Penn State game. Um, Northwestern had that gave them some problems on the ground that I would never expect at Indiana. So the same thing there. So there's absolutely still work to do. Uh, on, on those fronts and not a lot of time to do it. If you have any idea at all of, uh, of beating Michigan, one last thought I want to get to. And um, this was a James Franklin thought uh, said something along the lines. And I've seen this sparsed out on, on different headlines across the internet, but he won't apologize for winning, which I think under the circumstances, like, I think that's a really funny thing for Penn state fans to hear. Uh, and to be reading, it's like, I don't want you to apologize for winning. I want you to just continue to do that. And then I want you to not apologize for beating Ohio state or not apologize for beating Michigan. And, you know, I think where he was coming from was, was good. Like the, the context of that, if you dive into a little bit deeper is that he's talking about winning ugly or winning games that aren't pretty and how inevitable that is. And I think all those things are fair points. The one issue I had with this, Johnny, and I'll kick it over to you is that, you know, it got a little bit whiny. Like if we struggle to beat a team, it's all anybody wants to talk about or something like that. And I would just say that James Franklin is not very unique in that way. You think Nick Saban's phone isn't ringing if they beat, you know, Southern Miss 30 to 20 or something like that. Of course it is. That happens every, it's college football. That's what fans do. 
Uh, and so it's like one of those things where James Franklin has valid points, but sometimes he, you know, he crams something that can be definitely interpreted as an excuse in there to go with it. And it discredits the whole thing sometimes. Yeah. And one of the points that he made too, within what was a really long answer uh, after Wednesday's practice, and it was a point that he also made at, the, at his Tuesday press conference was that you know, three, I believe he said three of the top 17 teams last week lost to unranked opponents. You know, Oklahoma was one of them. North Carolina lost. Um, and so, yeah. And then he's like, Oh, well, well, Penn state didn't lose. It's like, yeah, that's, that's great. You know, that, that's, that's, that's great that Penn state didn't lose uh, as 31 point favorites against Indiana. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Fair, it's fair still for Penn state fans to be frustrated and annoyed and, you know, maybe a little upset that it came down to the final, you know, two minutes of the game against the Hoosiers to put them away. Winning is great. Obviously, they're seven and one. You know that that's you'd rather be seven and one than six and two uh, after those eight games. But to to sit there and say that it's it's like you know crazy or unfair to be to be judged on you know winning ugly. One like you mentioned, Dustin, coaches across the country and teams across the country, you know, face those questions all the time from their from whether it's media, fans, whatever. So that, that's just the business you're in. That's also why you're getting paid X amount of dollars is to, to handle that. Um, but to, to suggest that, you know, team, you judge me on winning. Like, I won't apologize for winning. You know, I, I don't know. It was, I, I just thought even, even the context of the last two weeks, losing at Ohio State and just not, you know, not beating the team that you haven't been able to beat and then going out and really laying a stinker against Indiana. I just thought the timing of it was, was very weird. Yeah. It's, I think just, just because it's true doesn't mean you're not whining. The fact yeah. that it, it, it is plausible and true does not take away from how it, it's interpreted. And you really can't have a program that believes the college football playoff is there in front of it and, and wants to be in that conversation all the time. And then not understand that fans are viewing everything through that lens. They're viewing everything as a, are we good enough to beat Ohio state? Are we good enough to beat Michigan? Everything that's done in the 10 other games is viewed in that context. And the first six games of the season didn't really support the notion that Penn State was explosive enough to beat Ohio State, and then they weren't. And then, you know, obviously he's right that there everybody has to gut one out uh, once or twice throughout the season, and the ability to do that and find ways that it's a it's a commendable thing. But please do not tell me that you're special and unique because fans are complaining about it. The college football fans, I think because of the makeup, how, how the sport's constructed and how you have to have one loss or zero loss to basically be a factor in the big, the big trophy race. You can't be nine and seven, like, or 10 and seven, like you were, you can be in the NFL and make a, make a run. Uh, I think that's part of it, but college football fans, man, they are probably the most pessimistic fans of any sport, I think. Yeah. And, and again, I'll go back to the timing of it. When you just lost to Ohio state, the way that you did, and you you attack another L on to that overall record against the Buckeyes, and then you have that performance. Like you're gonna get questions. You're gonna you know yeah. there's gonna be fans that are that are upset that 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 are that are pissed off. I'm sorry. Wow. Like it, it's it, it's not and it's not just unique to you either. Like as you're talking to James, like it's not just unique to him. The, yeah. These are college football fans. And, you know, if you're a Penn State fan and you saw what you saw at Columbus, you expect the team to rebound and to play well against Indiana and bury one of the conference's worst teams, frankly, one of the worst teams in the country, in the FBS. And they didn't do that. So, I, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I just, yeah. When I, when I saw that, I was just like, <laughs> but, not but, speaking but, your language. The timing of this is just awful. Listen, I, I just had one piece of advice before we wrap up here as somebody who's very good at being a bare minimum husband in a, in a, in a marriage. When fans call with that complaint, you need to guide them through it. Validate what they're feeling. Don't discredit it. And for the love of God, James, don't try to fix their emotions. All right. 
couple pieces of advice on the house for James Franklin going into Maryland week. Same kind of questions could, could come up next week if they don't look crisp and sharp, because guess what? Michigan's coming to town, whether you're crisp or sharp or not. And Penn state fans want to see that version, not just a win in the win column. That's Johnny McGonigal. I'm Dustin Hawkinsmith. Getting a little fired up before we wrap up on the blue-white breakdown. Stay tuned throughout game day and in the next week on PennLive.com slash Penn State Football. And download the blue-white breakdown anywhere you get your podcasts. We'll see you next time.